Welcome to the Fire These Times. I'm your host, Joey Ayoub. If you'd like to support this podcast as well as other projects, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check out the support page for other methods. If you cannot donate, you can still support this podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening and stay safe out there. So this is a conversation with Jonathan McIntosh. He runs the Pop Culture Detective Agency, which is a video essay series focusing on the intersections of masculinity, politics, and entertainment. He was also a producer and co-writer on the Tropes vs. Women in Video Games YouTube video series created and hosted by Anita Sarkisian. As the title suggests, this was largely a conversation about masculinity in pop culture. We spoke about the Big Bang Theory, we spoke about Steven Universe, uh, Newt Scamander of the Fantastic Beasts uh, film series, but only the first movie. Uh, Stranger Things and Star Wars. So, you know, uh, usual spoilers alert, I suppose. We also spoke about one of the most dangerous fictional characters of recent years, Donald Trump. Although Jonathan's work focuses on Western and especially American movies and TV series, the episode is structured to highlight common tropes that are present throughout the world. After all, it is quite difficult to ignore the influence of Hollywood on movies throughout the world, not that other film industries are necessarily better or worse when it comes to unhealthy masculinity tropes. So I hope you enjoy this episode and thank you for your time. My name is Jonathan McIntosh. I have a uh, YouTube channel called the Pop Culture Detective Agency. Uh, and I make long form video essays that uh, investigate pop culture um, with an eye for sociological concepts, especially around masculinity and politics. You think a lot about art and the role of art, especially pop culture, art, of course, deeply. So uh, just tell us a bit about Pop Culture Detective Agency. Why did you create it? How did it come about? And how has it changed over the years, basically? I've been working in media for quite some time. I started making uh, remix videos around the time of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, the second one, where I would take clips of news and I would kind of combine them with commercials to ridicule the... uh, the generals and the president and the, and, and the war in general. It was sort of very dark humor. Um, so I was sort of investigating media in, in that way, using video. Um, that was back in 2002, 2003. And I continued to kind of do that same thing here and there whenever I had free time. So I made a video called Buffy versus Edward, which, was, uh, which went viral and was very popular, where I combined Buffy the Vampire Slayer with Edward from Twilight to sort of highlight the ways that uh, the Twilight series downplayed some very troubling behavior from the male lead, and especially in terms of, of, of romance. Um, he was sort of a classic stalker in, in a lot of ways. And then Buffy the Vampire Slayer was used as a sort of a foil in that, in that video to, to show a different response uh, to that kind of behavior. Um, that, that went really well. People really liked that one. I made a few more, uh, and eventually I started working for uh, an organization called Feminist Frequency. I was a co-writer and, and producer on a series called Tropes vs. Uh, Women in Video Games, uh, which became a, a, a very popular, a sort of infamous uh, project because of all the hate that it drew from the gaming community, especially um, young men who were angry that there was any sort of investigation of, of, of the themes of sexism in, in modern video games. And the, the backlash to that project was enormous and was... Uh, was very troubling. Um, It was quite vicious, very personal, and there were uh, obviously a lot of attacks on the creator of that project, but there were also attacks on me uh, as as, as a guy who was working for this. And the the attacks on me uh, took on a very misogynist sort of quality, but they were, you know, attacking my masculinity, uh, and they were all sort of tied up in these concepts of of hyper-masculine bravado and aggression and so on. these gamers were sort of taking the, the the themes that they had seen and played in these in these games, and sort of, you know, putting me in the role of the villain in some ways, and attacking me, and certainly putting the other women who were doing this kind of work in the role of the villain too. And so out of, out of that experience, you know, which was which was very, which was very bad. I mean, I, there were death threats and and all kinds of things. They they found my family's info and harass them and you know try to get on my mom's facebook and stuff so it was, it was it was it was very bad and very pervasive it was a coordinated campaign but there were themes in there you know it, when you you sort of investigated what was co- you know the, the type of hate and sort of took 
when I when I took stock of 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 what what was the ideological underpinning of a lot of the anger coming towards the project. You know, it was young men who were uh, angry and who were having, um, you know, s- serious trouble uh, with concepts of, of their own masculinity, right? Uh, and projecting that outward in an aggressive, often um, scary way. And so I thought, well, you know, there, there's, a, there's a real need for someone to talk to these guys and to men in general about masculinity, especially as it's portrayed in, you know, sort of idealized forms in, in Hollywood, and to try, at least, to have productive, constructive conversations, breaking down, you know, those, those constructed ideas, and to try to highlight some more healthy ways of, of representing yourself in the world. Um, and so that's sort of how it, how it began. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I did see, or I saw the headlines anyway of some of the backlash. I don't actually click on these things. But um, it's pretty obvious, and I guess it's a bit ironic, I suppose, that the sort of things that they were using against you, let's say, are precisely the, the, the tropes and the, the um, let's, call, let's call them beliefs that you, you rightfully criticize in these videos, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to read some of the videos for those who don't know. Although I will obviously in the introduction to this episode recommend that people check out the YouTube channel first. But, um, you know, some I will just read some of them now. Uh, sexual assaults of men plain for laughs. Belligerent romance. Uh, sorry, belligerent romance. That's the Stranger Things one, I believe. Mm-hmm. Abduction as romance. Uh, stalking for love. The two Big Bang Theory one, which is adorable misogyny and the complicity of geek masculinity. Uh, and there's one also on Trump as a lovably or lovable sitcom misogynist. I want to focus, if that's okay, first on like adorable misogyny, because I think that's the first one I watched uh, on your YouTube channel. This trope is one which is common in, in many series, uh, most famously, of course, Big Bang Theory, at least in recent years. Can you sort of make the case as to how it works, or if you want to just explain it, I guess? And why do you think it continues to be used, despite some of the criticism it might get? Yeah, so adorable misogyny is a trope where... Uh, a writer or or a production team will create a character who is geeky and nerdy, sort of somebody who doesn't embody the hyper-masculine ideal, right? They're kind of intellectual, they might wear glasses, they're into video games or Dungeons and Dragons or something. They don't play sports, they're in fact very bad at sports, but they're super smart. And so in, in a lot of ways, they're sort of the opposite of this sort of archetypal male adventure hero, right? And because of that, there's a lot of a lot of room for humor, at least in 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 Hollywood's estimation. And the humor often comes from seeing these sort of geeky, more effeminate, sort of coded guys behaving in ways that you would expect the athletic jock to, you know, guy to engage in, right? So you have the 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 nerdy guy behaving as if He's Arnold Schwarzenegger or he's Vin Diesel or whatever, right? So he's kind of projecting this sort of male bravado, but it's, it's supposed to be funny because he's obviously not that character, right? And so then that then the laugh track comes in and everyone's supposed to laugh at, at, at how pathetic he is uh, because he's trying, you know, he's trying to be this thing that he is not, right? And within that, it sort of allows for a lot of uh, sexist and misogynist behavior that is quite overt, especially towards women, to sort of pass under the radar because it's seen as kind of harmless, right? It's like, well, yeah, he's doing those things. He's stalking that woman or he's, you know, he's he's being a peeping Tom or whatever. But he's such an unassuming, geeky kind of weakling that it's not threatening. So it's not, it's fine. It's kind of endearing uh, in the way that it's framed. And and that's kind of how it sort of, they get away with doing it. Right. Because if it had been a different character, if it had been Bruce Willis or some action hero who did those things m- most of the time, at least today, it would be considered, you know, not OK. But because it's this yeah. geeky, you know, character on the Big Bang Theory, then it's just sort of like, you know, it's, it's not considered to be positive behavior. It's sort of framed as as harmless. Right. Which, in my estimation, is kind of worse to frame that kind of behavior as harmless as opposed to good or bad. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember watching Big Bang Theory. I stopped at some point. It does get very repetitive at some point. But I remember feeling a bit 
uncomfortable with some of the characters, although I don't think I kind of understood why before watching your video analysis of it. Which kind of brings me to the point I'm trying to make as well is that some of these things are so normalized and so insidious in some ways that it's easy to kind of go along with it. And so I'm wondering, what is it that when you watch The Big Bang Theory, is it like you thought about it immediately or you thought, sorry, like you thought about the problematic aspects immediately? Or is it something that maybe followed some kind of discussion online that made you think more critically about something you had seen before? Or is it something along those lines? You know, it's something that I that I noticed right away. But, I, you know, I tend to, when I look at media, um, you know, I always have my critical lens turned on, right? So I'm always looking at it, looking for both positive and negative examples, even if I'm just casually watching something and I don't, I don't ever plan to talk about it. So I'm always sort of noticing those things. But it's when it becomes a a pervasive pattern, and I see it in, in multiple pieces of media, and I see a trend, that that's when it kind of piques my interest, and I go, okay, well, maybe there's something that should be talked about here, and especially if we're seeing sort of reflections of that in the real world. Um, so certainly with the rise of tech culture in the United States, you know, I, I was living in San Francisco when I when I started writing that video, you know, and that's a, there's, a, there's a big tech boom there, and there's a lot of parallels to what we're seeing on the what we saw on the Big Bang Theory to the, the sort of sexism in tech and internet business culture in Silicon Valley, and so uh, it seemed especially relevant to sort of talk about it in you know in the context of of the Big Bang Theory because if you just sit down with someone and you say hey let's talk about sexism in 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 the tech industry, a lot of people are are not going to want to have that conversation or their eyes are going to glaze over or whatever. But if you say hey did, did you see this show? last night what did you think of it you know uh that can be a, a sort of an in to be able to talk about these sort of larger social issues that have real impact on people's real lives but in the context of a, of a fictional uh piece of media that can be it, it can be a lot easier to engage on those sort of difficult or contentious uh topics and so that's kind of how i approach these things i sort of look for uh something that that should be discussed or needs to be discussed in sort of a larger culture, I sort of find examples in media, and then I use that media, especially popular media, to have a conversation about this real-world thing. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm less interested in in, in the show itself or the or, or the movie or whatever, and more interested in what it's saying and how that reflects on or mirrors things that are going on in the real world. Yeah, for sure. And as a general rule, I mean, obviously, the, these are getting quite a lot of good feedback. I'm assuming, you know, I don't know something like. 740,000 subscribers or something like that. It is definitely speaking to a lot of people. I am curious because I think, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, given that when you watch media, you automatically have this critical lens, what would you say if you were watching the, let's say the backlash, the hate videos from that same critical lens? Would you, in theory, for example, not that I'm, I'm asking you to do one or anything, but what if you were doing a video commenting on that, what would be some of the things that, let's say, you would be focusing on? Uh, well, you know, I, in in a lot of ways, I sort of did this on my own. I didn't I didn't make a video about it. I, I but I I certainly analyzed the type of hate that I was getting, and that the the project for feminist frequency, the the Trump versus women project, was getting about from gamers. You know, one of the things that Anita, who ran that project, did is that she would would take all the hate that she got, which was you know ten times worse than anything I experienced, even though what I what I experienced was bad. Hers was you know ten a hundred times worse. She would take all of that and sort of categorize it, right, and then do an analysis, and she would give talks based on the analysis of, of that hate and, and, and deconstruct the ways that uh, misogyny was at play and, and, and how it was manifesting. And so, you know, seeing her do that and helping her sort of, in some ways, uh, catalog some of the hate there, um, it was sort of built into the, into the job description in, in a lot of ways, right? You did the, the writing and the producing and the cataloging of hate, right? That was the sort of the necessary <laughs> part of the part of the job. Uh, and so, you know, when I when I look at men who create these um, videos, either critiquing me or, or or other men who are sort of on the on the left or, or who are supportive of feminism, you can see similarities. You, you can you can pick out a lot of sort of ideological underpinnings, uh, belief structures, and you can and you can criticize them. I mean, there's a really a whole cottage industry of, of young, mostly white men who build sort of mini careers on YouTube and social media, just bashing women and attacking men who they don't think are, you know, uh, uh, dominant or, you know, uh, enough. And it tends to come from 
from the right. And there's a lot of sort of alt-right figureheads who could have came up in that ethos. If you look at what they're saying and how they're presenting their arguments, it is often a, there's a obsession with control and dominance. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, masculine control and dominance, not only over women, but especially over other men, right? Because a lot of patriarchy it is, is sort of not really about women. I mean, it is in that women are sort of this bargaining chip or a status symbol, but it's also often characterized by a competition between men for dominance. Um, and you see that in politics, you see that in media, you see that all over the place, especially in sports yeah. and so on. And so in, in this competition for dominance, they need someone to sort of put down as less virile and less masculine than them. And uh, often that foil for them is, is, is liberal or left-wing men who they can dunk on and they can try to make themselves, you know, seem more aggressive or more dominant or more violent or more willing to be violent or whatever. And so, you know, and then there's also a lot of a lot of racism in that ethos as well, where they mix sort of hyper masculinity with white supremacy. And then, you know, then they, they, they're 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 trying to to position themselves above men of color, especially, but, you know, men in general uh, who, who are not as tough as as they talk, you know, um, and that theme sort of runs throughout. And, and there's a very virulent form of anti-femininity, right, which is really what misogyny is, right? They are opposed, aggressively opposed to anything feminine, right, especially as it relates to them or men in culture, right? So that's why we get all this whining about the feminization of men and so on and so forth. It's, it's a simply a reactionary sort of backlash uh, against the idea that men could be empathetic that men could be care, caring and, and be caregivers, that, that, that men could want to align themselves with uh, struggles for equality uh, among women, among people of color, among queer groups, trans groups, et cetera. There's sort of a, you know, a, a, that's a, there's a lot of the backlash is, is sort of built up in this, in this resentment, this sort of aggrieved male entitlement where they feel like the other groups, you know, gaining some equality or moving towards equality, there's a long way to go, but moving towards it is taking something away from them because it's a zero-sum game, and for them, dominance is key. And so as long, you know, if they're not at the top, then they feel like they're, they're nothing. And, and, and you really do see that like over and over again in these, uh, in these sort of YouTube reactionary right kind of um, uh, hate mobs that, uh, that you're talking about. So, okay, so... Enough about the hate, uh, <laughs> the the hate stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that kind of comes with the job these days. Although it's still very toxic, and I do appreciate even your answer now. I think it's a it's a good uh, way of looking at it. So it's a honest, critical perspective. And I guess I had more of a meta question, but I will try and preface it with some of the things that I do. So I do my research, my PhD research is on Lebanese cinema, specifically post-war cinema. So 1990s onwards. And a lot of the themes that I go through uh, have to do with violence and trauma in one way or another. So whether I'm looking at temporality or like how people experience time, whether I'm looking at nostalgia, whether I'm looking at sectarianism or even at masculinity, a lot of it, not all of it, but quite a lot of it, uh, does boil down to trauma in one way or another, or at least trauma gets uh, justified or gets used to justify these violent practices in in the context of Lebanon. I had a lot of uh, thoughts when I watched your Stranger Things video, especially the, of course, the nostalgia aspect. So that video has the romance, the belligerent romance, or which goes back to, of course, toxic masculinity and all of its in all of its forms. But the nostalgia aspect is something I'm very, very interested in because in my country, in Lebanon, nostalgia at some point was like an almost an entire industry. And I know that in the U.S., it's also something, especially of the 1980s. And of other time periods is something that is also very common in in popular culture. Can you talk to us a bit about how the role of nostalgia in popular culture, in the, in the American context at least, or in whichever context you you you're most familiar with, and how that plays uh, or how that changes over time? So, for example, there is this argument um, which I I think I've seen f- floated also on YouTube that there's a sort of a cycle, like every 30 years or 40 years or something, a, a specific period gets romanticized and revamped and recreated, uh, we might say, 
in in a modern context, like as we might see with Stranger Things, I guess it's the most popular recent example. Can you walk us through nostalgia as a trope as well within within movies and within TV series? Uh, yeah, well, I can certainly try. You know, I'm not familiar with Lebanese cinema, so this well, is that's fine. Be... That's fine. Just in your context as well. Yeah. So this this is the way that Hollywood um, sort of approaches nostalgia. I think is is fascinating and 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 often troubling. It can be fun, you know, but there's sort of consequences to it. Uh, and one of the consequences is that as we move forward in time, progressive change happens because of, you know, the enormous ongoing struggles of movements for social justice. And so the what is acceptable, you know, 30 or 40 years ago is often no longer acceptable, which is which is a good thing. You know, that that's the testament to the hard work and struggle and and push from a great number of people and social movements o- over time to, to sort of bring us to a place where uh, some of the of the past has been looked at critically and and rejected um, certainly there's a lot of work to there's a lot of uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done but you know there's a, there's kind of an, an overt misogyny that has been a part of Hollywood for since the inception of Hollywood, right? And it was, you know, if you go back and look at a, like at a James Bond movie from the 60s or 70s, it is blatant, it is in your face, it is unapologetic, and it is gross. Um, it's horrific. It's horrific. Yeah, I've, seen, it, I've seen some of the older ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just, it's just. I mean, it's just, it's just sexual assault framed as, as, a, as a positive. <laughs> just, I mean, just, just straight up, no, you know, there's no irony or anything. It's just, this was good, you know? It's just this idealization of male aggression and violence towards women. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just it's, it's, it's as blatant as you can get. And so as we move forward in time, people can look back on that and go, whoa, 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 we've, we, have, we don't do that anymore. Right. You could argue, of course, that it also wasn't OK at the time that there were many voices pushing back against it, especially in feminist movements and so on. But the, the success of those movements today means that we can look back on that stuff and go, oh, my God, this is completely unacceptable. Right. So what happens with nostalgia is that there is often, you know, especially in terms of sexism or racism or transphobia or or homophobia, you know, especially there is when when we go back in time and we and we sort of lionize something from the 80s or the 70s and we use that as an inspiration to bring it into the into the modern area. Stranger Things is just one example where they're going back in time and they're saying, "Hey, remember all these awesome movies that you remember from the 80s and and early 90s? Let's recreate sometimes word for word scenes or fr- from from those movies or TV shows." And 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 often more often than than recreating them, they sort of are paying homage in a very direct and uncritical way. Right. And so what happens is, as a sort of consequence of that, is that there tends to be, you know, along with the aesthetic and the techniques of filmmaking that they're bringing forward and kind of updating, but you're sort of referencing that time frame. They tend to bring the values, often wholesale, and then reproduce them in the modern era. And so you get things that um, are uncritically reproduced. And the nostalgia, so it isn't just for those old movies or the or the style or the or the, or the writing of those old movies, but it's often the underlying social values that can be now, we see them as quite regressive, can be reproduced and in sort of uncritical homage. And so, you know, I talk about this in my video on Stranger Things and belligerent romance, is that there were the way that men treated women, especially in things like Cheers or or, the, or action movies from the 80s, uh, was abusive, right? And it was sort of framed as, as, as romantic because they didn't give up and they, you know, they were, they were treating her badly because they secretly liked her, right? That kind of thing. So when you, when you bring that into the modern era and you just reproduce it uncritically, you are reproducing those values. There's a nostalgia for the way, the sort of aggressive masculinity of the past, which we have as a society worked very hard to try to move past. You know, there's obviously a lot of work to be done, but, you know, it's almost sort of reactionary. It's sort of anti-progress, where it can be. Nostalgia can be this sort of manifestation of a longing for a time when men could be men and women knew their place, right? That's kind of what it ends up being. Now, it's not always that way. Some nostalgia properties are a little more critical, where they try to bring, you know, or update things as they move forward. But there is that trend, 
which is to sort of go, oh, remember the good old days when we didn't have to think about all this stuff about, you know, <laughs> about sexism or about racism or whatever, and we could just, you know, do whatever we wanted. And that obviously is coming from the perspective of the people who are creating this media, who are funding this media, and often that perspective is very white, very male, and very heterosexual in, in Hollywood. And so in that way, nostalgia can be, I think, quite regressive. Do you think there's a way where nostalgia can be used or can be exercised, let's say, in, in a healthier way? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it takes a lot of effort. Though. I mean, that's really the thing about media is that it's easy to follow the conventions and to sort of reproduce them in a slightly different way, to kind of give something old a new coat of paint and put it out there and make a lot of money, right? Um, that's easy. It's much harder to go back and try to pull something forward that was denigrated at the time. So you could use the nostalgia for, say, the civil rights movement in the United States or the, the sort of anti-war protests of the 60s and 70s. You know, you could you could tap into that kind of nostalgia as a way to sort of highlight those movements for change and sort of the, the more positive push for social justice and, and, you know, and bring it into the modern era. Where, you know, and those many of those struggles are still ongoing in various ways. So, uh, you know, that would make sense. And that would be, I think, a very positive thing. You could look back for those rare pieces of media from decades past that were forward thinking um, and did have in various ways something positive, something trans transcended, something, something tra transgressive going on. And you could try to highlight those things. So, yeah, I, I think it can be done, but I think it has to be very intentional and it is much harder to produce. It's a much harder sell than just saying, oh, you remember Die Hard? Here's another Die Hard, right? That's easy. But to look back at something that was maybe not popular <laughs> at the time and say, oh, actually, this was really cool because it was way ahead of its time. I, I think that's possible. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I do. One of the things I do appreciate about your channel, and I, I do I do mean this honestly, is that you also focus on some of the you know positive tropes that can be explored in, in pop culture, in cinema, in TV series, and so on. And so I'm wondering if we can sort of transition to speaking a bit about the, I think there's two main ones, if I, if I remember correctly, like the Newt Scamander one and the, the Steven Universe one, where you sort of explore what positive masculinity or positive forms of masculinities can actually look like in the context of newt i guess like more adulthood version and steven universe obviously more like boyhood version can we talk a bit about that and why did you choose these two examples for example it is very hard to find a piece of media a piece of popular media in the united states or coming out of hollywood that embodies what i would consider to be positive or healthy forms of masculinity Especially if we're looking at like a superhero genre or a fantasy adventure genre. Uh, those are genres where hypermasculinity is <laughs> is considered the ideal, right? It's the, it's, it's the standard. And so when you see something like Steven Universe or, or in the case of Newt's Commander, um, the first Fantastic Beast movie, it's quite jarring or can be quite jarring because it's, it's showing you something that is that is so different. That the, the contrasts are so extreme to most other cartoons about sort of fantasy adventure stuff and and most other movies in the terms of, of Fantastic Beasts in terms of, of a male sort of fantasy adventure wizard hero. And it is striking when you really think about what's different and why. And so, you know, I was watching Steven Universe. Someone had said I, I should watch it. And I, I don't watch cartoons very often unless it's unless it's recommended to me by a whole bunch of people and it's worth my time. And I found that Steven Universe was radical you know, in, in the way that it was presenting boyhood, in the way that it was presenting the sort of coming of age story, because you had a young a young man who his primary role models are women, or at least female coded characters. And all the gems are, are coded as women, even though there's no real gender in, in, um, in that world. You know, and then he has his father figure, who's sort of a sort of a bumbling Homer Simpson type, but like a really sincere, genuine, caring version. You know, if you took all the all the negative stuff about Homer Simpson, you threw it out. That's what you would get as as Greg, who's who's Stephen's father. And so in that space, he's allowed to be emotional, and he's allowed to cry, and he's allowed to get you know get scared of the monsters that they're they're confronting, and he's allowed to express this you know, very wide range of the sort of the, the full range of human emotion, which is something that is typically not allowed for male characters. And if it is allowed for boys, the story, the, the arc of the story is them learning to suppress it, right? To learning to overcome their fear and not be afraid and never cry and be tough and then learn how to fight. 
right? And then do- and then dominate whatever the problem is, and then that's the end of the story, right? That's that's the traditional sort of boyhood coming of age arc, right? Scared kid into tough guy, you know, hero who wins. And Steven Universe isn't like that at all. Steven Universe is a character where he's he's cries, he cries about everything all the time, and it is never considered something that is bad. Right? He's never told to toughen up or you know, or or man up or or anything. He emotes and it's not just that it's it's there. It's framed as a positive. You know, he's got this healing power. And his you know, his mother could cry and then her tears would heal people. And 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 his is basically kisses, right? He kisses somebody then they then they heal. And so you know, this sort of affection as a superpower for a young boy is very, I don't think there's any other example, really. And, you know, over the course of the of the show, you know, he, he never has to toughen up, you know. He has to come to terms with trauma and he has to come to terms with uh, difficult things and a troubling past and his identity and so on. But he never has to suppress him, his, his emotions or his feelings to do that, right? They're considered to be a healthy part of that transformation. That is really unique and I think really positive. I mean, even other shows on the Cartoon Network that are about young boys that are, you know, cute or whatever, don't do that. And very specifically don't do that, right? If you look at Gravity Falls or something, those messages are not there. In fact, the opposite messages are there, sort of coded in in heavy layers of irony. So that makes Steven Universe special. In terms of Newt's Commander, yeah, it is sort of a grown-up version in some way, um, although it's a more, much more reserved sort of portrayal. He's much more sort of careful, and he's he's sort of coded as someone with autism, even though that's not necessarily part of the text. I mean, that's the way the character is played on, on screen. And so he has a, an enormous amount of empathy, but he has trouble connecting with people. And so that empathy, that caregiving, is really the core of this of this character, right? So he cares for magical creatures, he writes textbooks about them, and he nurses these creatures back to health, and he writes textbooks. I mean, that's that's a hero of a fantasy adventure film, right? I mean, there's no other example where that's the case, right? He doesn't have a sword, he doesn't fight dragons, he saves the baby dragons, and then he writes about them in a boring textbook, right? <laughs> that's this character, right? That's the hero. Um, <laughs> Which is which is great, I think. And he, you know, he also has an enormous amount of empathy uh, for the people around him too. And in fact, he has a, a sense of of, of injustice. You know, he can sense injustice, and he and he's angry about it in his in his own quiet way. And so the way that you know the in the magical world of Harry Potter, you've got a very troubling setup where there are magical people, and then there are muggles right? Non-magical people. And there's a, there's a real, some very not nice things going on in that, in that metaphor. And he, this character, Newt, is the only one who's like, actually, this is not okay. And so, you know, it's, it's refreshing and it is unique. And it's also too bad that the JK Rowling is turned out to be such a horrible person in real life. It's really just terrible. She's an awful transphobic person and she's using her power and influence to to spread this awful stuff. So uh, that's something we have to consider when, (laughs) When, you know, I, that wasn't the case. When I made the video, she hadn't revealed herself to be so hateful. But currently, it's it, that does sort of temper my love for this character a little bit. But, you know, the character itself is, is just still, uh, I think, a unique example. Uh, I'm just sort of less inclined to uh, sing its praises most of the time because I, of where it comes from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that as well. And it is a shame. I do like the first movie. I, I didn't really bother. I did watch the second one, but didn't really bother after that. I feel like, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, you do sort of say in that video that the, the character would be developed a bit more, like they would focus on him more, but you were worried that he would end up becoming like a secondary character, which is sort of, which is kind of what happened, to be honest. So I will sort of wrap it up on my side by asking you two questions. One, let's say one is a bit more serious. It's like asking you, like, what else, what are next things that you're hoping to analyze? Like, what are some of the next videos that you're working on right now? I know that there's the board games one, for example. And the other question, which is the kind of the funnier one, is which Star Wars do you think is the best one? <laughs> well, that's that's the most contentious question that you've asked so far. Yes, I um, think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll save that one for last then. In terms of next steps, you know, I'm I'm always looking for media that talks about something or has a message that I think is interesting or or, or, or needs to be deconstructed. And thankfully, there are no shortage of things in media that that need to be talked about. So I, I have a whole bunch of projects on the horizon. I'm always keeping lists and I'm always keeping, you know, outlines for scripts. And I have, you know, maybe. 
50 or 100 of them, sort of various stages at this point. But the next video that I'm working on is called Boys Don't Cry, Except When They Do. And that is going to be focusing on, really it's going to be focusing on the the times and places where men and boys are allowed to cry in media. Because they do, you know, I mean, basically every male character has a scene where they cry, even the tough guy action heroes. And so it's it's sort of t- investigating what spaces they're allowed to do that in and how limiting the framework is where that's permissible. Sort of open vulnerability is, is permissible, but only in these very narrow, sort of once in a lifetime almost situations. So that's that's what that video is going to be about. And then, as you mentioned, I have a, a project called Colonialism in Modern Board Games, where I am taking dozens of, of modern popular board games and deconstructing them in terms of their theme. One of the major themes in the modern board game boom is colonialism, still. So there are still dozens and dozens and dozens of games where you as a player will you know be Columbus or be you know Europe and you will go off and you'll explore and conquer uh, other places around the world and then loot their resources and bring it back to Europe to make your kingdom stronger and then whoever has done the best colonialism at the end of the game is the winner and there are you know released this year and last year I mean dozens of these uncritical you know <laughs> and so I'm I'm looking at, at, at that theme and talking about why that's so damaging. And then finally, uh, I have another one, another video essay in, in the works, which is about how uh, men can find redemption in stories. And often in media, at least in, in, in Hollywood, the way that, that troubled men who have sort of done something wrong, the way that they find redemption is through death, right? They are killed in some sort of violent act of heroism, and then that's their redemption. They, they, they never have to go through the hard, long process of self-transformation, of rebuilding relationships in their lives and so on. They just have to die in some sort of heroic way. They have to go down in a blaze of glory, right? And that's something we see over and over again in media because it's, it's a shortcut for writers because it doesn't require the, 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 the boring stuff, which is going to therapy and, you know, repairing your relationships. And so that's, you know, that, I think that's a, that's a major theme that has troubled me for a very long time. And I'm, I'm watching hundreds of movies to, to deconstruct it. All right, and so the last one is the most difficult one. Right. <laughs> yes, Star Wars. What was the question? What was the best? What was the... Is that the question? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just being annoying on purpose. Yeah, basically, okay. what, what, what is your favorite Star Wars? Or what you, because you do have one on The Last Jedi, and this ended up being a, a conversation with a few friends of mine, because personally, I'm not a big Star Wars person, but this is my favorite one. And I know that this is a contentious uh, opinion in the more hardcore uh, spaces of the internet. Yeah, well, I have a whole I have a whole video about it, which you can watch, uh, or people listening can watch, which is about how The Last Jedi sort of defies expectations about male, male, male heroes. And I think that accounts for a good portion of the underlying fan backlash against that movie is because it took you know it, it took these expected conventions and then it twisted your expectations of them in ways that I think a lot of people especially young men who are into fantasy and science fiction do not like <laughs> it's ironic though because the original trilogy did that as well the original trilogy was constantly twisting expectations about what we expect from male heroes at the time i mean return of the jedi culminated in a scene where the hero refuses to fight the villain it just throws away his weapon like how many action heroes have you seen, seen do that probably none almost none um so it, you know the original did this as well and so in my my take on it and a lot of other people's too i think is that the last jedi is the most true to that original formula like it really understands what made return of the jedi and empire strikes back and, and a new hope interesting and it, it builds on those characters in ways that that actually make a lot of sense if you really pay attention to those that original trilogy. So uh, the answer to your question is I, I do think The Last Jedi is probably my favorite for, for those reasons, because it, it's challenging. You know, it takes things are f- that are familiar and it makes us look at them in a slightly different way, or it makes us, you know, we have these expectations about what male heroes are supposed to do and how they are supposed to grow in power. And that gets exponentially more powerful. You know, they, they be, they're supposed to become, you know, Gandalf or something at the end. You know, Luke is supposed to be this all-powerful wizard who can, you know, pull starships out of the sky with the force, you know, and who can who can decimate whole armies with his mind. I mean, that's what we're expecting if we just, you know, take his power and then we extrapolate it out into the expected tropes of male heroes. But that's not what happens. 
you know, what happens is that he fails as he has always failed. You know, Lucas is a failure. That's what makes him interesting. You know, he tries and fails. And so in The Last Jedi, he is a, a hermit who has sort of given up on the world, which is completely in character for Luke Skywalker. You know, I totally expected for me. I'm like, yeah, of course, that that totally fits. And, and his failures, though, are something that he's able to learn and grow from, which is what Yoda talks about, right? I mean, he tries and fails and tries and fails and, and eventually overcomes. And I, you know, one of the things that I like about that that last battle, which isn't even really a battle in The Last Jedi, is that, you know, you, you sort of do have this archetypal triumphant hero moment where Luke Skywalker walks out and faces down an army by himself. That's what I think a lot of young men, male fans, wanted. And I think the movie knows that. <laughs> and so they gave it to us, but they subverted it, right? So he walks out there, he faces down the entire, you know, First Order, all of these walking tanks and all of these these uh, ships and everything by himself. They try to destroy him. He doesn't get a scratch, you know, <laughs> and then he fights the villain. And that's the sort of moment that has been sort of built up in this heroic, you know, idea, you know, this heroic archetype of this ideological male hero. But what happens is, of course, it's not real, because Luke knows that that's not what a Jedi does. He doesn't face down an army and kill everybody, and so he's been projecting, you know, he's been projecting himself into this thing to give us a show, right, <laughs> of what we think we want, but then to subvert it and say, hey, I'm not even really here. I was just buying time. I was giving you this, in, in this case, Kylo Ren as sort of a stand-in for the what fans are expecting, which I think is kind of ironic too. And then he's furious that he didn't get this big battle that he wanted, right? And Luke has just disappeared because he's projecting himself from some other planet somewhere. And the heroes can escape, right? So it's, a, it's sort of a perfect culmination of that throwing away the lightsaber moment from Return of the Jedi, you know, projected into this, in, 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 into this battle where Luke doesn't have a lightsaber. He's not fighting. He's just making the villain think that he is, uh, which I think is, is perfect. It's a, it's a perfect moment. And I think that's part of the reason why so many people were upset about it, because it, it seemed to give them what they wanted, but it was really a trick. And that trick revealed something uh, a little bit troubling about our expectations. And it made us look inside and go, oh, maybe I shouldn't have wanted that. Maybe Luke was right. Is there anything that you feel you, you wanted us to talk about, but we didn't have time to talk about? Well, there's there's certainly always something to talk about. We've had a very contentious uh, election here in the United <laughs> States. I'm not sure yeah. if anyone's paying attention, but I think you know if we look at Donald Trump and and and, and his toxic bluster, there's a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about in terms of negative media representations that he has sort of embraced and embodied and then projected outward. And I think you can see a lot of Hollywood in the way that he engages, and not just you know because he happens to be a, a, a TV and movie star, but because he embraced a lot of those really negative, toxic values, especially about manhood, and then just tried to put all of that out into his persona. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of stuff to talk about, um, but I think we, we, we covered a lot of the, the, important, uh, the important bits. Here I'll just say, and you know, this isn't a fully developed thought, but I have seen a few people make the argument that it is very interesting that around the same time when you have the nostalgia of the 80s, coming back, you also have another actor becoming president, or at least TV star becoming president, obviously referring referring here to Ronald Reagan, and then Donald Trump being a sort of a different uh, version of that. Although I don't, I'm not going to take this too far because I feel like this is a complicated conversation. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, do feel free. I mean, if you, if you don't mind, I, I would be interested to know that that you did on Trump, which I think was a few years back. If you were to update it today, let's say, uh, are there many things that you would change? Uh, well, so that was a response to his initial election, which is, came as quite a shock to a lot of people. Although yes, I, I was yes. I was worried that, that he would that he would win. So it was really about why people accepted him, why they they saw these horrible things that he did, the way that he treated women, the way that he that he behaved, and they they didn't think that that was really a, that big of a deal, right? Again, it's sort of this idea that like people knew that he was a horrible sexist and a misogynist and he had sexually assaulted people and so on. They knew that, but they saw it as no big deal. They saw it as, you know, harmless, essentially. And so I'm thinking, well, why, why where do we get that, right? What primes us to look at someone in power and go, oh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, he did that stuff, but it's okay, 
right? And I think one of the reasons is because we have seen on TV and in movies for you know generations at this point that same kind of behavior played off as no big deal. Either played off as sort of endearing or played off as negative, but eh, kind of harmless, right? And so there's this character, this uh, this lovable misogynist character that we see over and over and over again. I mean, the Big Bang Theory guys are one version of that, where you know a character is overtly sexist, but he's still you know a member of the family. You still invite him over to Thanksgiving. You just kind of go, oh, oh, Uncle Joe, Pfft, you know, he's just like that, and it's no big deal. And no one really challenges on it, him on it, and it, it isn't, it isn't framed as something that should change our relationship with those people, right? It's no big deal, and that's really the way that people thought of Trump, and I think still do in a lot of ways, uh, or at least half the country does. Although it is less than half the country, I have to say that the people who voted for Trump are, are, are only about less than a quarter. But, but still, it is there, and and that hasn't changed. Um, you know, if I was going to make something about Trump today, I think it would be more of a reflection on, you know, what happened over those last four years and how he embodied and sort of projected this tough guy persona, which, you know, let's face it, Trump is not a tough guy. I mean, not, not that anyone should be, but he isn't one very specifically. And he is a mm -hmm. rich, entitled, privileged, you know, kid who has never had to do any hard work ever. <laughs> you know, he is not yeah, a tough yeah, guy. Quite literally. Yeah, he's not a tough guy. He's a rich, spoiled brat. But he has projected, he sort of created a character, right? A fictional character of a version of himself that is a tough guy. And he's able, he's been able to convince people that he is that tough guy by talking like he is and by sort of imitating the mannerisms and inflections and uh, ways of speaking that you would see in media uh, from fictional characters, which is the same thing that Reagan did. You know, I mean, Reagan, Reagan's whole persona of a down to earth cowboy was it was a fiction. You know, it wasn't real. Same with George Bush. I mean, George Bush, yeah, yeah. the second, uh, you know, George, George W. Bush, he was also not a cowboy, even though he, you know, he bought a ranch a couple months before the election so he could be photographed with a cowboy hat walking around on his ranch. But, you know, he's a, he's an, a rich Ivy League kid uh, who had no experience whatsoever with being a cowboy. And then that way, politics has a lot in common with Hollywood, right? I mean, they really are selling a persona. And often that persona is, is a lie. And in the Republican side especially, but on the, the Democratic side too, they, the Democratic side, they often try to toughen up these sort of uh, liberal politicians to make them seem like they're more, more of a gun-toting, you know, blue-collar character than they really are. Now, in, in terms of Biden, you know, he's sort of the opposite in that he actually is from like a tough working class background, but he, you know, has this sort of polished, you know, uh, aristocratic persona. So it's sort of weirdly the opposite, but he still talks like he's a, you know, he's a factory worker, right? Um, because that's where he comes from. Um, but in terms of Trump, in terms of George W., in terms of Reagan, that was all, it's all persona. And it's all just this fiction that is very carefully crafted very carefully put out there in the world to make them seem like a blue collar, down to earth, get your hands dirty, tough guy, when in fact they are anything but. Uh, but it is a very powerful narrative. And so I think I, I, if I was to make a video about Trump again, it would be it would be about that. Well, thank you for your time, Jonathan. This has really been great. Yeah, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.